All right, looks like we can go ahead and get started. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself to everyone. My name is Akshit Patel. Um, I am a member of DFA and I serve on the Gender Affirming Care Committee. Um, and I wanna welcome everyone uh, to our panel this evening. So before we get started, um, I just wanna take a quick minute and invite everyone to officially join Doctors for America. Uh, being a member means taking the important and simple step of selecting a membership and paying our annual membership dues to support DFA's organizational, organizational sustainability. There's six different levels to choose from. A DFA member uh, will put a chat uh, to join. Uh, we'll put a link in the, in the chat to join. Uh, we're also gonna be live streaming this panel and making a recording uh, with all of the materials available for afterwards. Just a few quick ground rules uh, for this educational session. There are no such thing as stupid questions. And speaking of questions, uh, please remember to use our Q&A feature. Uh, we'll be addressing your questions during the second half of our sessions. And um, also look out for comments in the chat. DFA staff will be sharing helpful links during our session. Now, uh, moving on to today's uh, speakers, we have uh, Dr. Crystal Beal and Dr. Maisha Price. Uh, Dr. Crystal Beal, who uses they, them pronouns, is a board certified family medicine physician and started Queer Doc with a mission to raise the bar in gender affirming care and improving LGBTQ lives through telemedicine based clinical services, provider education, and LGBTQ DEI healthcare consulting. They leverage their lived experience and medical expertise to offer a level of unsurpassed nuance to their services. Being a both and informs Dr. Beale's personal practice of medicine and the training they offer other healthcare workers. Dr. Beale attended Florida State University College of Medicine, where they helped found the LGBTQ medical student group. They completed their training at Valley Family Medicine Residency Program. Dr. Beale sought extensive training, adi extensive additional training in sexual health, queer health, and gender affirming care, including self-study continued medical education trainings, and shadowing experts in the community. They have focused CME in the topics of cultural humidity, trauma-informed care, sex-positive care, and kink-affirming care. They share their knowledge working with medical students and through their online program, QueerCME.com. They identify as FEM, which is not a binary nor a cis identity to them, and are super queer themselves, enjoying queer burlesque, vintage fashion, and their queer, kinky, poly family. And our other panelist for this evening is Dr. Maisha Price, who uses she and they pronouns. She is a senior research scientist at the Trevor Project. Dr. Price has more than 15 years of experience in adolescent public health research with a focus on sexuality, gender, and LGBTQ youth from an intersectional perspective. After completing their PhD in developmental psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with research focusing on predicting early sexual behaviors during adolescence, they were an assistant professor at the State University of New York at Old Westbury prior to taking a postdoctoral research associate position at the Center for Innovative Public Health Research. Her primary research interests areas include developmental understanding of adolescent gender and sexuality and reducing LGBTQ youth mental health disparities with a particular focus on the role of protective factors. Uh, thank you both for being here uh, this evening. I wanted to start off the program by uh, just kind of giving you to the floor. Um, if you can share your experience so far, um, kind of what brought you into the space, any challenges that you've had along the way. Um, and kind of just give us an insight into the work that you do. Um, Dr. Beal, if you want to kick it off. Sure. I've never sat through someone reading that whole bio and I'm like, oh, I need to make that shorter. Um, um, yeah, so uh, like I, I'm a board certified family medicine physician and I think frankly ended up in this work um, for two reasons. One, because I'm part of this community um, and there was definitely some peer pressure from my community. Um, and two, like, it's exhausting uh, to be, like, it's exhausting to be, like, a queer and trans 
staff member at a traditional healthcare system. Um, and so staying employed in traditional healthcare systems just like burns me out incredibly quickly. Um, like the all the extra like lift and emotional labor that is asked of us um, in those spaces, which I feel like is the conversation about that has opened up and I'm hoping that is maybe changing um, for people. Um, but for me, there was always this push and pull of like, please do all of our queer education, but actually can you be a little bit less queer because it's kind of a lot. Um, and so that just like, that just didn't work for me. Um, and so I was like, I'll just like do things the way I want, um, which means like I will have a tiny telemedicine practice that like um, just does what I'm interested in and like doesn't have to like deal with administrators and investors and all of the kind of things that go with like traditional healthcare and that isn't the answer for everyone is not the solution for everyone. Um, like I had a lot of privilege in being able to create that um, um, support from like my family while I was doing that, um, right? Um, and I didn't have to support a family at the same time. So like there were a lot of ways that that really um, came together for me. Um, and in, in doing that and having direct clinical services for patients, like I really started to look at um, I really love the doctor patient relationship. I really love working directly with patients. It's like such a joy, right? Like I have the, the cutest like 15 year old trans kid in their little leather jacket the other day. He looked like tiny Danny Zuko. And I was like, I can't say that to you at all, but I'm going to tell everyone else about that. Cause like you are adorable, you know? And like six months ago when I met him, he was suicidal and like wouldn't actually look in the camera. Like wouldn't be like mostly in frame, right? Um, because his dysphoria was so bad. So like, there's so much joy in doing this work. Um, and like, as a, a clinician, I can only affect the lives of my patients. And that's a limited number of people that I can see. And so I really like started looking at like, how can I affect more lives? Like, how can I affect more trans and primarily trans lives? Like most of my work is with trans patients. And so um, that really like started looking like, training, education, and advocacy. Um, and so I think that's really how I've ended up like more in these spheres as well. So about half, half my time is clinical um, and about half my time is like training and advocacy now. Does that answer the question? I don't even really know what the question was. Sure. Yeah, no. Um, and if you could talk about just the work that you do in general, um, like with Queer Doc and stuff like that, if you can talk about your experience, what was that like starting that up? Oh, yeah. Um, interesting. Like I started a telemedicine only practice in 2018, like before telemedicine was cool. Um, most people actually like really questioned whether or not I could provide the standard of care, um, through telemedicine. Um, and a lot of people just thought it was like real odd. <laughs> um, I had had, I had gotten the like joy of working with Kaiser, um, in their prep program, which was like entirely phone-based visits. Um, and so I'd really seen you know, narrowly focused telemedicine work really well. Um, and so I really was convinced that it could, and here we are now and everyone agrees with me now. So that's great. Um, and Career Doc really functions like a small private practice pushed online. Um, I, like I said, like healthcare administrators, um, venture capitalists, like not, I have no interest in that. Um, definitely some like other telemedicine practices like have taken that approach. And like, I think that's amazing. I, one, the more options trans people have in their healthcare, the better, like that there is no reason that like, that is not a good thing. Um, two, like when you have funding, you can serve more people, right? You can expand more rapidly, you can serve more people. And I think that's also absolutely amazing for like my personal sustainability in the work, like having to justify my clinical care decisions to like my investor just wasn't going to work for me. Um, and so we started really, really small. It was just me and like some money from my bank account and a lot of time building a website very poorly on the internet. Um, and then just primarily grew through word of mouth. I have never done paid advertising for the clinic. I don't think paid advertising belongs in healthcare. Um, I don't think healthcare should be a business. It's weird to own a healthcare business, but um, yeah. So um, 
and then we were just kind of really positioned well when the pandemic happened and suddenly people understood that there are online doctors like you know before that people really didn't understand like what our practice was and then suddenly people were like oh this is a thing and I can google it um and so we switched from like primarily word of mouth to like so much of our clinical practice coming in through google and search engines um and yeah and then um that's been growing well I have like three other clinicians with me now um and some also some like actual staff they have um um, we have a, like a clinical administrative, administrative support person, and then someone who's helping us with like social media, um, stuff as well. And then I've, like I said, divided my time into like teaching. I launched like an online subscription-based, um, CME program for people to learn trans and gender affirming healthcare. Um, there are a lot of other resources to learn it as well. Uh, but I think, and there's a lot of other amazing people out there teaching it. I just like, one, I guess I think like, I have a lot to say on the subject and I'm happy to like self promote that. <laughs> and two, um, I like, I don't know. I said this the other night in a, a section, I learned so much about how to be a good physician actually from one of my partners um, who is also a physician um, in like, so much of like centering my patients like values and centering their goals and like like actually stopping to hear those and understand those and like make that what our visit is about as opposed to like the boxes I need to check because epic says I have to get through this um and like that changed like I didn't learn that in medical school I didn't learn that in residency I had great training I had like really biopsychosocial patient-centered care training and that I still didn't get it in that way that I got it from like my significant other. And so that changed so much about how I approached patient care and how I interacted with my patients. And I just think that that message is so like vital. And the fact that I, as a person who am really invested in that, missed that through my training, um, it felt really important to start um, sharing that on a broader platform to me. Um, and I know like our patients have a different experience at Queer Doc than they have anywhere else. We have a 95% patient retention rate and we have an NPS of like 86, both of which are unheard of in the healthcare industry. Um, you know, and we hear it all the time from our patients that like they've never had this kind of experience as a clinician. You know, they've never had someone listen to them like this. They've never had someone explain it to them like this. Um, and so I think like trying to center that and make that a more like just talked about as clinicians like we should be talking about this like when we are training people um and we should be talking about this with each other um just became really important and I think because like every time I get asked a question like every single time someone's like what would you do in this situation in this clinical scenario and like my like always every single time is what does the patient want to do right and it's like recentering that question and like coming back to that like my opinion matters actually a lot less than like what your patient sitting in front of you said that they needed. Um, they are the expert in them. And we're just like, you know, educators in options and healthcare. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. yeah, that's, I don't know. That's how I ended up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, that makes me think of, you know, just like my own medical education and how we're taught that like, you should be taking those patient considerations into your management plan. And I feel like that that is a very recent thing that is brought on in medical education. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, and, and it's great to hear that there's someone that is taking their patient perspectives into mind when they, um, when they, when they do medical care for their patients. So thank you for sharing. Um, Dr. Price, do you want to take it from here? Yes. Um, speaking of bios, I regret not having something fun at the end of mine. I got to work on that. Um, yeah, so I'm in, uh, the. I guess I, I'm technically considered a developmental psychologist. I usually like put that up front before I present any research because um, research is inherently biased. I think people forget that. Like I think even starting with the question you're asking, the question you're trying to respond to. So I usually start off by saying I'm a developmental psychologist. I can't help but think about lifespan stuff. Um, and the, um, psychology kind of has a, a, a habit of centering the person. Um, although I like to think I do a better job at that. Um, but that's the the background I come from. Um, 
I'm also um, I come I'm also queer in both my um, sex orientation gender identity. I like to present that as part of uh, before I give research talks, and I also like to share that you know right now I have um, actually um, they're turning five. I almost said a four year old. Um, they would correct me so quickly on um, on Sunday, um, and so and I like to share that you know my kid is assigned male at birth, but loves a, a princess dress for parties and the theme of that party is gonna be Frozen, much to my mother's disdain. Um, the movie Frozen, not the you know winter wonderland. Um, so yeah, those are things I like to share when I talk about sort of my experiences and how I got to where I am and you know the way that I look at research and the passion that I have behind it. Um, I got my uh, developmental psych degree in Wisconsin, um, speaking of cold, and I studied, there I studied uh, predictors of early sexual behavior from a public health background. Um, and so then I ended up doing the thing that you do when you get a PhD, uh, the thing they want you to do at least. Um, I got a tenure track uh, faculty position um, in New York. And so I moved to New York and lived in Brooklyn for a couple of years. Shout out to anyone who's in Brooklyn. Um, and then I realized this just wasn't a good fit. Uh, not necessarily, I mean, there are issues within academia. I think um, Dr. Bill talked about issues within <laughs> medicine. And I think they're very similar, not similar, but there are similar issues and concerns with trying to navigate um, the academic um, world. Uh, I ended up leaving academia. Speaking of making bold decisions, I didn't have any kids then. I didn't even, I thought I didn't need health insurance. That was fake. Um, but I also uh, left academia and serendipitously found a position at a small nonprofit I was doing research. Uh, and that research was looking at predicting, I mean, it was looking at teen pregnancy prevention for young, um, it's, I, don't, I don't remember the age, I think it was 14 to 18, uh, cisgender girls who, as long as they didn't identify as exclusively, exclusively heterosexual. Um, and that was interesting because it taught me a lot about how to make sure sexual messaging and prevention, uh, pregnancy prevention can be um, salient to people who would be like, I have no interest in that. Um, and how you have to make sure that the language you use isn't, uh, you don't, you don't um, sort of make the mistake of assuming that certain body parts go to cert with certain genders. Um, and the government doesn't do a great job at that. So we did a whole lot of rework in a lot of the scales and a lot of the measures um, and that. Then I ended up coming across this position at Trevor and it was one of those, I think somebody wrote a job for me because that is exactly perfect for me. One of the things I enjoy about the work that I do here is I don't think anyone goes into research with this idea that they're gonna do research that's just gonna be read by other researchers, that's just gonna be consumed by other researchers and nowhere else. Like I think most people start a research career like I'm gonna change the world. And then they just sort of, like that just sort of gets like, push further and further out of them, the more they, the more time they spend in grad school. Um, and there's a, a, in my opinion, it's a social justice issue that research can, um, is behind all these paywalls, $25 a day just to read something um, is ridiculous and it doesn't reach the audience that needs it the most. So that's what drew me to Trevor is the ability to be able to do the work I love to do, I know how to do, um, it's about something I'm absolutely passionate about while also um, making sure that you know, those who need it the most, you know, whether it's ranging from my parents who read about the work on like websites, news websites, and have no idea that it's me. Um, and it resonates better with them that way than if I said it out of my mouth, um, all the way up to, you know, uh, people who are on the ground fighting some of these legislative efforts um, to use the work that we're doing at Trevor uh, to support their work, their um, important work in getting and, uh, and getting uh, fighting some of these anti-trans bills and supporting the ones that are protective for, for young people. Can you talk about some of the research that you've done through Trevor and kind of what the results were of that? Oh my gosh, for days, I can absolutely do that. Um, the research team at Trevor has this sort of mission of producing and using innovative research that can sort of um, inform a lot of the knowledge and clinical implications as they relate to suicidology and mental health, LGBTQ um, young people's mental health. And that's kind of like a lot, um, but it, ultimately the idea of the research team is to be able to collect data that can inform, not just, um, so in, that can speak to the experiences of LGBTQ young people um, and broadly. So I think there's, um, it's important that we, that we sort of make we make it clear that we're not doing, uh, when our research isn't just among, isn't among youth, 
um, who are interacting with Trevor, Trevor Services. Uh, we, I like to kind of almost say it like, you know, we could be doing this work somewhere else. We just so happen to be doing it at Trevor um, and have, you know, the backing and the support of Trevor and to be able to be included in this um, holistic approach um, to inform LGBTQ health, mental health. So that Trevor, there's the, I think most people are aware of the crisis services suites that we have. Um, that's actually, you know, 24 seven um, access for youth who may be in crisis, young people who may be in crisis, but then there's also, you know, the the services that are uh, as Trevor Space, which is our uh, social media, or not, so, I wouldn't call it social media, but yes, social media for um, an online safe space for young people, LGBTQ young people. We also have the advocacy um, department, which I sort of already hinted to in terms of the work that they're doing um, in advocacy spaces and as well as education. So I like to think of it as a sort of holistic approach and that the research is embedded throughout all of that and that we're informing some of these efforts, we're providing them the data that they may need. Um, and we're also uh, we're also interacting in these academic spaces that I left, right? Uh, because it's important to have our work be validated. It, research is kind of a weird world in which like, you kind of need to still be like friends with your friend, like with them so that they're like, Yes, I think what you're doing is great work. I respect it. So you can you can move so far away, uh, but not too far, <laughs> um, to still be considered, you know, one of the the uh, someone that they think is doing valid research. Uh, so we definitely still, you know, go to conferences and present in academic spaces, peer review journals. Uh, so some of the findings that we have, as they are particular, I think, to uh, some of the discussion today, uh, we find that across the board, trans and non-binary youth report higher rates of all of the uh, mental health indicators that we measure. And this is every year and no matter how you slice it. If I look specifically at black, trans and non-binary youth, native, like they're always all, they're always reporting higher rates of these mental health outcomes that we look at. And this is inclusive of uh, suicide, test your suicide attempts. Um, so um, there, when we look at even compared to cisgender LGBTQ youth, and I think that's an important no, because already LGBTQ youth report higher rates compared to cis straight youth. So then you look at what's happening with trans and non-binary youth, and you see that even higher rate of, of um, you know, having seriously considered suicide and attempted suicide in the past year. And one of the things that we also find is, you know, one of the biggest questions is why, right? Like, why would you see these high rates? And so one of the things we we try to aim to do is look at risk factors for this, but also importantly, protective factors, right? So risk factors are are some of those like victim is, experiences of victimization, discrimination, um, physical harm, and things like that that young people are experiencing. But also, I, I like to remind folks that it's just hard to be a young person, right? Like when you think about your experiences, I'm sure every one of us can think of like something that maybe now you may not think wasn't that bad, but at the time it was the worst thing that could ever have happened to you. And so we have to consider that trans and non-binary young people are experiencing the same stressors that other, you know, cis straight youth are experiencing on top of, you know, these added stressors of, of being trans right now in this country um, and having people, you know, debating their identity, your very existence and identity, you know, on a national um, platform. Um, when it comes to these protective factors, however, it's important to remember that because we know this higher risk is due to uh, this higher, um, yeah, higher, reporting higher rates of, of past year suicide attempts is associated with these risk factors, then the obvious answer is like, hey, let's get rid of the middle person and not have these risk factors in their lives. Um, so the protective factors are quite often um, what we see with trans and non-binary youth is having access to affirming supportive spaces, um, places that affirm their identity. Um, and what that looks like, a, a, that can look very, um, I think <laughs> when I think about like what this looks like to me, it's like, that's so easy. Why aren't people doing this? Like, we're not asking you to change the world, right? We can see, decreases in suicide attempts in the past year uh, when youth pronouns are respected, right? And that to me is not, it's not that hard, honestly, right? So that's a step. We have, uh, we also have findings that show um, youth having access to neutral bathrooms, uh, gender neutral bathrooms is also related to um, reduced odds of past year suicide attempts. And so when you think about all of these efforts, it's sort of like, uh, we know that if, I like to use the analogy of, 
when like when when uh, kids are babies and there's some like there's glass on the floor for example like you're not gonna be like hey excuse me like avoid that glass like you're not gonna tell the baby watch out like there's glass there like you're gonna clean it up right like as the adult in the room you're gonna clean up the mess so I think it's important for us to think about that when it comes to trans youth it's sort of like it's on us to clean up this mess. Like we have to make it safe for them, not them. Like it has nothing, like, yes, like they, I know that there's a lot of self-protective measures there, but it's also like, you know, up to the adults who are in charge of these spaces they find themselves in to make them more affirming, affirming and welcoming to them. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think about, you know, how research always is a double-edged sword where I feel like a lot of academics just kind of talk amongst each other, but don't have any like real world applications. So thank you for sharing that, you know, you were able to find a position where you were able to kind of bring that along as well. Um, and, you know, we were, we did have a, a focus of this session tonight on kind of the advocacy realm of, of all of this and how we can kind of uh, move our action to more of a legislative or an like a institutional advocacy world. Um, unfortunately, the panelist who was the expert on that um, was not able to make it this evening. Uh, but Dr. Beale, I was wondering if you have any kind of experience with that, um, you know, training in Florida and with all of the sort of things that are going on in Florida and throughout much of the country today. Um, if you have any kind of examples of when you were able to advocate for your patients in that kind of legislative field. I have like multiple things to say about this. So cut me off when, when you need to. Um, so like, if you are interested in like protecting access to gender affirming care and becoming like involved in advocacy, I think step one, learn how to offer gender affirming care. If you are a clinician and you don't know how to offer it, learn. It is actually not very complicated. It's like a formulary of like 10 drugs. Um, two, get involved with other organizations, like don't recreate the wheel, um, right? This is like important anytime you're looking at doing any kind of advocacy work, um, you do not need to be the knight in shining armor. You need to plug into organizations that like already have this framework in place. And so that might look like your local, like, like we have our King County Medical Society. We have our Washington State Medical Association. Um, you know, we have the LGBTQ interest group within the American Academy of Family Practice. There is GLAMA, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association. Um, there is your Equality Federation. So like Equality, your state, you know, Equality, Washington, Equality, Florida, Equality, whatever state you're in. Um, there's also an organization specific to pediatric care. Um, it's called the PACT Coalition. It's facilitated by Whitman Walker. Um, and so um, like, go like whichever of these institutions you're already involved in right you're already part of like work with from within that organization to get their voice amp into this space right because like your local medical society or your state medical society already has connections with legislators lobbyists they will be able to get you in the in front of the legislators they will be able to get you talking to these people um and so like go from it in that way so that you already have like support behind you um, and then like, um, also like utilizing something like the PAC coalition or like some of your already pre-existing resources, they will train you in how to do these kind of situations, like how to sit in front of the legislators, what to say, um, you know, so they will do like testimony training for you. Um, and I think, um, well, I would, I would say like, that is one of the ways in which I would start. The other way in which I like would suggest getting involved is like, um, speaking about this to your friends, to your family, to your colleagues, um, right on social media. Um, so often what is actually needed is like individual input on things, right? So like a lot of these pieces of legislation, whether they're state or federal, actually have open public commentary periods where anyone can submit a comment. Um, and what is needed is like massive amounts of comments. So like actually having your Washington State Medical Association, like we need a comment from them that is signed on by a bunch of clinicians, but we also need like 5,000 comments from the constituents of this area saying like, we do not want this passed. This is not legislation we want. Um, this is how this is gonna hurt us, your voters. And so actually like getting the people in your life to take action. I, I cannot tell you how many people who don't like have like actively someone in there, like that they know in their life is trans, like that just have no idea this is happening. Like have no idea. Like 
you know, I'm, I'm with the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. I'm doing some like training, like business mentorship and the per, like the person mentoring me through the NGLCC, <laughs> like doesn't know that like anti-trans youth care bans are happening. They're like, oh yeah, I just go home from work and like take care of my kids, you know? And I'm like, God bless. I hope they're never trans, you know, because like they just don't know. And so I think spreading the message that we need your individual action, that you don't get to call yourself an ally. That it that is not an identity. That is an action. It is a verb. And if you do not back it up with an action, you don't get to claim it. Um, and so I think spreading that message and and motivating people to take like movement and action, um, it's so easy. Like your local LGBTQ nonprofit will probably have like a fast action on their social media that you can just click the link and it'll take you to the form and you can submit your comment and they'll oftentimes have like a template for your comment. Um, so just spreading that message like throughout your personal community and via social media is another like way you can get involved. Um, and I think, you know, always also like if you have financial resources to donate to these local LGBTQ nonprofits, to the Quality Federation, to ACLU, um, to these organizations that are primary leaders in um, the on the ground fight at the state level to prevent like these care bans um, is like another way to get really involved in, in pro protecting access to care. Um, I'll, I think I'll, I'll stop now, like we'll stop there. That was a lot, I mean, I just pointed a lot of fingers and told you you couldn't be an ally. So, you know, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> no, that's really helpful. I think that um, gives us a lot of things to kind of work off of as well. Um, and for the members of uh, uh, the presentation today, we do have a list of resources that our panelists have provided for us. Um, and we will include some of those organizations and some of those steps that Dr. Beal has mentioned um, in that after, for after the session. Um, Dr. Price, we have a question for you from our Q&A. Um, have you come across um, any kind of research regarding sports or being active um, with like decreasing depression, anxiety, or suicidality in our youth? Um, the question is from a family sports medicines physician. Um, and they've seen, you know, spikes in with the recent spikes in like the sports bans for transgender and intersex uh, youth. Um, if you can comment on that a little bit on kind of the productive factors of sports. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And those bans are also like happening and um, part of the conversation to be had here. I'm going to give a caveat. That I don't have a lot of background in the research on the uh, broader, you know, health impacts of, of sports participation. I will say that uh, there's obvious benefits to it, I think, for for everyone, right? When you think about um, young people and the, the ability for that it can obvi the obvious one is physical um, but there's also just like learning to be a teammate right learning to to um, uh, follow rules to take turns like it's just sort of things that are just part learning the process of losing like learning to process losing I think is also just part of of uh, the benefit of participating in a sport and it's why my kids in gymnastics right now because I'm like yes They'll learn some of those things. Um, have a coach that you have to listen to. Um, and I think with these bands, it's specifically not allowing, it's not allowing a specific group of young people to get those benefits. And that's the, the beginning of that conversation. Is this like there there shouldn't be anything, I think, when we talk about um, our country, right? And equity in terms of like something is useful, but we're gonna specifically not allow certain people to do that. That is pretty much the definition of discrimination. Um, and so I think that's the first beginning part of that. We have, we do have some research on youth LGBTQ youth participation in sports. Um, we have found that it is associated with uh, um, reduced rates of depression, for example, um, and that um, there are indeed, um, LG, like, I think sometimes there's this like assumption that you know, queer kids aren't wanting to do sports. Um, we do find that they are, like a, a, a close to one in three on our surveys are participating in sports. Um, and then we also have asked like, do you want to, but are you not allowed to? And we see those, those numbers come up too. Um, I think that is the group that is being targeted by this um, ban or the, those who, these bans are those who want to participate and are unable to do so. Um, so yeah, there's obvious benefits to it. And there's uh, these, you know, bans are obviously problematic. Um, in terms of their not allowing youth to get ben the benefits of sports participation. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, just uh, I can imagine how a youth's inability to participate in those social realms, like you mentioned, can have such a lasting effect on their developmental as a whole um, by being excluded from that. And kind of on a similar kind of page for that, uh, we have some medical students in our audience today that are kind of wondering about, um, you know, how can they advocate for their patients um, without having specific like patient narratives behind them um, from their experience. So I was wondering if, if you know of any institutions or any specific research projects that are that like healthcare students or medical students can use in their advocacy um, to kind of back that up without having the patient narrative. I'm assuming that that was for me or was it for? Um, it could be for <laughs> either of you, yeah. Okay, yeah, I think it's, um, that's, yeah. Obviously like first person narratives are, are powerful um, and important um, to this work. I also think that, and this might be inherent bias, but I think research is also important. Um, there's, there's there's so much research out there um, that is supportive of the of of gender affirming care, and I think some of the 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 first step that I think people think of the first thing they think of is gender affirming hormone therapy. But I want to remind folks that gender affirming care is is way more broad. It's it has it's way broader than that. So you can talk about social transitioning. You can talk again, uh, uh, respecting young people's pronouns, using their chosen name. These are all very strong predictors of better mental health outcomes. Um, and it has been, that's been, and that's in the literature so much that there, we're not exploring that anymore. We know that, like we're, we've moved on. So that's, those are things that you can find um, quite easily in the literature. We have, um, but when we do start to talk about hormones, I think that's when um, it's complicated, right? So we have a, a, a manuscript that we were, that we um, pub were able to publish in 2021. That was uh, the first large scale study that examined gender hormone gender affirming hormone therapy, and it had a sample of 9,000 transgender and non-binary youth. And in that, we were able to show that there's significantly, that, you know, uh, GHT is significantly related to lower rates of depression, suicidal thoughts, and suicide attempts in transgender and non-binary youth. And that's an important study. There are, other, there are others like that. It's not the only one that exists. Um, and so I think, you know, just sort of finding these studies and being able to use them in terms of citing um, your position when you don't have that uh, narrative, uh, that first person narrative to back up what you're trying to say. And oftentimes it's, it's you know, throwing 9,000 <laughs> at someone is, it can also be very impactful, right? When you think about what that looks like in terms of the sheer volume of those kinds of results. I completely agree with Dr. Price. Like when gender affirming care is not just hormones, it should actually be every, like all care. Every single part of care should be gender affirming care, um, just like trauma informed care, just like standard precautions. Um, and I actually, I'm about to, I'm not going to say the F word, but I actually really um, find it appalling that first person narratives are like such a part of driving the conversation. Um, um, people should care about human rights because people should care about human rights, not because they heard the trauma log and tragedy story of some trans kid. Um, and so um, I actually find that part of this work really disheartening and really frustrating. I am like a much more data-driven person. And so like, to me, exactly what Dr. Price is saying, like we have, you know, we have studies on thousands of youth showing that this is life-changing care. Um, and that is what should be driving this decision. Not like that you knew a trans kid, um, you know, that was your like, friend, your neighbor's kid that, you know, attempted suicide and ended up inpatient and now they're doing so much better. Like that's not, that's an N of one and that's not how we make decisions in medicine. Um, and so, yeah, I would say, um, while it is an important part of this work and always people want that personal attachment and that story, I actually find that quite frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think using facts is a great way to kind of collectivize a narrative as well, rather, rather than just like pointing out one single person. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, Dr. Beal, a specific question for you. So regarding kind of your experiences using telemedicine, um, how have you kind of handled lab work for your patients? Um, 
do they do it at their local lab or send the results to you? Um, if you can speak on that little technical aspect a little bit. Yeah. And just so that, like, sorry, one more comment about the like med student thing. Um, a primary way in which this, the anti trans care narrative is driven is by disinformation. Like up, that is the primary way it is driven. And so like focusing on that disinformation and like having like the clear, correct information, like being able to explain where their methodology was wrong, like why that research is not appropriate. Um, and like, this is the research that is, like that is actually like a very effective strategy that again, doesn't rely on you having practice experience. Um, if you wanna see an amazing example of that, you can watch Meredith McNamara's um, testimony to the Florida Board of Medicine. Um, as she's a clinical researcher. Um, and so she does a phenomenal job of like continuing to like stay on topic that, you know, this is disinformation and this is, this is the flaws in the methodology and this is where we're at. Um, also the science-based medicine, gender affirming care is not experimental part one and two blogs that AJ Eckhart helps author. Absolutely phenomenal at pulling apart disinformation. So really great. If you want talking points in this context of like being an advocate and engaging with your colleagues um, and engaging with uh, like legislators and media, like I think those are really great resources for that um, to answer the med students question and maybe one of our objectives. And then, yes, we have a national contract with Quest um, and LabCorp and so patients um, can go to either. Um, we also, if they don't have a LabCorp request near them, we can upload a digital copy of lab orders that they can take to any local facility. Um, if they do them outside of Quest or LabCorp, we do require that they actually have a copy of the results in hand at the appointment um, because like relying on that local community place to fax us the results is like useless. Um, and so that, that's how we manage that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and then I, one other question that kind of comes up in my mind is, you know, you both are doing such great individual work. Um, and I think that that deserves a lot of uplifting from the medical community as a large. Um, so I was wondering if, if you can think of kind of ways that medical providers can help uplift the work that you do um, in your own respective fields. You can go talk to a friend. <laughs> You're like, I got a lot to say about that. Let me let you go first. Um, <clears throat> I love that question. I think a lot of times, um, the first thing I can think of is, um, you know, the Trevor Project does a great job at disseminating the findings. Um, I have, you know, to thank our communications team for that. I, I have, as a researcher, I have no ability to do that. Um, but one of the things that's important is, you know, I'm not a medical doctor, right? Like I can talk until I'm blue in the face about, you know, the findings that we have. I can't prescribe anything though, right? Like, and so I think it's important um, for medical providers to be on that, that advocacy side of things. Like if someone were to directly ask me a question about some of this, um, some of the medical care, my answer would have to be, I'm not a medical doctor, right? And so I think, being able to have, um, you know, a co-conspirator, if you can, if you can um, say as much, in the fight, right? That like, yes, you're telling me that this is not what how doctors feel and what doctors say. Here's my friend who says otherwise, right? Um, so I think that's a big part of, it, particularly when we're, I'm thinking about the advocacy team at Trevor and what would benefit them. Um, I think that's something that uh, Dr. Bill already mentioned is sort of like use use the platform that you have, right? And use that in the best way that you can. Um, so I can go in and, um, you know, present data all day at a, you know, a school, a school board meeting. Um, and that's the, the, the work that I can, how I can use my own, you know, privilege in this space to do so. Um, but it has limitations. And so I think that's where we can partner with people who are doing advocacy work, people who are doing medical care, people who are doing other aspects of this. Um, and, and, and the fight to, to make sure these uh, youth are supported and protected. Yeah, that again makes me think about like the cyclical nature of research and academics and how they kind of just inter talk with each other. Um, and it's, you know, I think that just highlights the importance of kind of breaking away from that and being able to apply it to more real world examples um, to kind of make use of that research in a way. Um, Dr. Beal, do you have anything to add to that? 
I, I don't, I think that was like very well said. I mean, yeah. sol- I said solidarity in everything, which is like literally in everything. So. All right. Um, are there any other last minute questions um, from our audience today? But um, have, is there any other final thoughts that, that either of you have um, before we kind of start closing out today? I'll try and like, because I feel like maybe the one objective we didn't touch base on was highlight successful strategies for improving and expanding gender affirming care with your and your medical school residency program or institution. Um, and one, whoever that attendee is, like, if you want to email me later your specific questions about advocacy, um, feel free. Um, but um, strategies for improving access, like, GLAMA um, has their medical student, like, part, like, a, group um and that's like what i did at my medical school right we started our own medical student group there and so we did a ton of training and education for everyone there um and so like that was really really helpful and that helps expand access to care um similarly like the you know um residency programs like need extra training as well and so um considering like helping create a curriculum at your residency program right, um, that can be implemented or like you, we usually have to teach new didactics, right? They, we rotate through that process as learners and as teachers. And so like having your topics focused on topics in LGBTQ health, right? Um, um, and then the National LGBTQA Health, health Education Center, which is facilitated, facilitated through Fenway um, is free CE, CME for people. So you just create an account and then you can access all of their trainings, online webinars, online for free and get CME for it. Um, you know, you can get involved with conferences, um, WPATH, TPATH, UCSF. Um, they all will do conferences on, on all of this. Um, and then um, local nonprofits, like, so your local LGBTQ nonprofit or your local trans nonprofit will also do trainings for your clinic and your staff, right? To create more affirming clinical environments. Like this is a very common thing that they do. Um, and so reaching out to them, connecting with them, having them like come and explain to your clinic, like these are all the areas where you have an opportunity to improve like on affirming practices. Um, yeah, so I think like improving and expanding gender affirming care access like starts with improving and expanding education. Two thirds of primary care providers do not feel comfortable providing gender affirming care. Um, three out of four endocrinologists don't feel comfortable providing gender affirming care. They're supposed to be the hormone specialists. Um, and so it really is about getting this curriculum into the medical school, into the residency, um, so that the graduating clinicians feel more comfortable. Um, and I think that happens, um, it needs to happen from the top down, but that's like not where we are right now. So it happens from each of you, like bringing it into your institution. Yeah, I think that goes back to the point of on, uh, you know, how medical students can kind of make change. I think, um, you know, I think about my own medical school and how much we were able to advocate for our own education. Um, and I think there's with enough people that are excited about this field and passionate about actually making a change in their institution. Um, I think the institution has no other option but to listen and kind of take what their what their demands are um, when it comes to their own education. Um, Dr. Price, do you have any kind of final comments to make? Um, I, I, one of the things that, that I wanted to just sort of remind folks also is that I think there's oftentimes this disconnect between mental well-being and physical well-being. Um, and people like to think of them as totally separate uh, when actually they're ridiculously interconnected. Um, and so I think a lot of times, um, you know, they'll 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 respond to right like the Trevor project being like you know these youth are 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 suicidal but it's more difficult to make the connection with what that means in terms of gender affirming care and um how do we make sure that we you know sort of provide this messaging around these things are are intricately connected and we have to start thinking thinking of them as just as important right when you think about preventive care in medicine, like how do we put that, what does that look like for mental health? And if that means gender affirming care, then that's part of this. Um, so yeah, I think that's um, something that I think is important to leave folks with. Can 
can I chime in on expanding access to care? From, like, yeah, quite, okay. Sorry, I'm like, I don't know when y'all are gonna cut me off, but um, yeah, so the question was like, how can we expand access to care? These young people that didn't have access even before bans. Um, so one, like learn how to provide the care yourself, <laughs> step one. Step two, have a really great referral network, um, right? Like have like, and this is something that I think a lot of clinicians don't realize, you have to vet all of the, your referrals that you were gonna send your trans patients to. That maybe isn't you, maybe it's a social worker on your team, maybe it's a student intern, maybe it's a volunteer, but someone needs to make sure that the people you are sending your trans patients to is actually affirming, um, right? Because otherwise they're gonna be traumatized, they're gonna be harmed. Um, and they need to be affirming and inclusive in all ways. Because like the last thing you wanna do is send a trans patient to a top surgeon who then tells them they are too fat for surgery. Because um, imagine how fucking harmful that is. Um, and it happens every day. Um, and so know how to do the care, know who to refer to. Um, and then in these states that do have bans, like there is some work being done, like both underground to like move trans patients, like to areas where they can access care. Um, and also above ground, actually, there is a, an organization called Elevated Access. It's volunteer pilots who will fly people who need gender affirming care um, um, for free to a place where they can access it. Um, and then I know also like, again, Whitman Walker and that PAC coalition is working to try to facilitate some way in which we can like, again, work around these states that have bans. So like, can we provide care on federal land, right? Like if, it, like where in that state is federal land where clinicians can practice outside of those state laws, um, right? So those things are all in the works. Um, and so like, that is a very important part of this work in, in, in expanding access. But the other like really everyday part is that none of these kids who need care are gonna get to us who don't have a supportive adult in their life, right? And so like, again, this is conversation you need to be having with the people in your life every day. This needs to be destigmatized. It needs to be normalized. It needs to be a, like the idea that everyone is cis, that everyone is endosex, that everyone is heterosexual it needs to be erased from our society and our culture because it is incredibly harmful. Like, so when you're talking to like your niece, your nephew, your neighbor, like don't ask them if they have a boyfriend, don't ask them if they have a girlfriend, like ask them if they're interested in someone, ask them like if they're interested in like sexy things at all, like maybe they're asexual, maybe they're agender, like we need to stop like kind of the bias assumption that is in our language that continues to other and stigmatize trans people and trans kids. Um, and that is like something to undo for each of us in our language every day. Um, I like, okay, I'll stop. I, I could talk for like three more hours on this, but I'll stop. No, I think that's such a great point to make. I think both of you have truly left us with the great, great ending point um, on how it's so important to have those conversations with the people that we have in our lives. And even the people we just incidentally kind of meet because you never know who they can affect in their life when they, when they um, are more knowledgeable. And then always backing these stories up, sorry, Dr. Bill, uh, and then backing everything up with, um, with data and with science is always important too. Yeah, like the best opportunity if you have a pet and someone asks you your pet's gender, like I always respond, gender is a social construct and my dog hasn't told me their pronouns yet. Um, <laughs> Right, so like make this part of your everyday life and conversation. That's amazing, thank you for sharing that. Um, so I, we are coming up on time. So I just wanna close out today's evening by thanking the two panelists that we have. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, sharing your work, sharing advice um, with us today. Um, for our audience, uh, watch out for the advocacy alerts that we offer. Um, those are kind of just opportunities to provide any kind of um, advocacy spin on current hot topic issues um, like gender affirming care, like reproductive health um, to our constituents. So please be on the lookout for that. Um, before you leave, there's a couple of quick reminders. Um, we will have additional resources available on our website after this event. Um, I think both of our panelists shared a plethora of different organizations and resources um, that are just so rich with information. Um, so please be sure to check out our website for that. 
Um, we hope that um, you know you'll consider becoming a DFA member today. Uh, please take a look at our benefits on our on our website and get plugged into medical providers that are doing a lot of this work um, that we have talked about today. And as always, please please follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of that to um, stay up to date on what we are doing as an organization. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Beal and Dr. Price for joining us today, and I hope you have a good night.